Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. Suppose Zn is a sequence of complex numbers, and suppose Z is a complex number. If Zn converges to Z, then 1 plus Zn over n to the power of n converges to e to the Z. Now, before we get to the proof, let's get some context. Now, what is e to the Z? Well, we know that e to the Z is the limit of 1 plus z over n to the power of n. For all complex numbers z. Further, we have also shown that 1 plus x over n to the power of n is an increasing sequence for every real number x greater than or equal to 0. So if x is equal to 0, then this is just a constant sequence of once. Otherwise, if x is strictly greater than zero, then we showed that this sequence must be a strictly increasing sequence. So when we say that this sequence is an increasing sequence for all x greater than or equal to zero, what we mean here is that every term of the sequence is less than or equal to the term that comes after it. Now, because this sequence is an increasing sequence, if we recall, by the monotone convergence theorem, we know that the value that this sequence converges to must be the least upper bound of the terms of this sequence. Well, the value that this sequence converges to is e to the x. So e to the x is the least upper bound of the terms of this sequence. Right? And what does this mean? Well, we know that every term of the sequence will therefore be less than or equal to e to the x. So if we consider an arbitrary positive integer n, well then, 1 plus x over n to the power of n is less than or equal to e to the x. And we know that 1 plus x over n is greater than 0. Well, if we raise any positive real number to the power of a positive integer, that will still be greater than 0. So for any real number x greater than or equal to 0, and any positive integer n, we have this inequality. So, before we get into the proof of this theorem, we are first going to prove some preliminary results. And for the first preliminary result, let's consider two arbitrary complex numbers, z and w. Let's consider an arbitrary positive integer n. And let's consider an arbitrary real number n such that absolute value of z is less than n, and absolute value of w is less than n. Now, for complex numbers, we have the following equality. Right? This equality. And we can express this in summation notation. So we have this. Now, we are going to consider the absolute value of z to the n minus w to the n. Well, the absolute value of z to the n minus w to the n is precisely the absolute value of the right-hand side. And the absolute value of the right-hand side splits up into two absolute values, right? It's equal to the absolute value of z minus w times the absolute value of this sum. So just like that. Well then, we can apply the triangle inequality right here. We know that the absolute value of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of absolute values. Now, if we consider an arbitrary term of this sum, let me write it out. Then, again, we can split up this absolute value into two absolute values, right? The absolute value of z to the n minus 1 minus k times absolute value of w to the k. Just like that. But then another property of absolute values tells us that we can pull the exponent to the outside of the absolute value, right? So pull the exponent to the outside of the absolute value. So just like that. So we can re-express every term of the sum like this.
So then what do we do from here? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to show that every term of this sum is less than or equal to a particular value. So let's consider an arbitrary term of the sum. And k is just some integer between 0 and n minus 1. Now, we know that absolute value of z is less than or equal to capital M. Absolute value of w is less than or equal to capital M. And let me just write down that these guys are greater than or equal to 0 because we are going to use the following result about real numbers. Given any two real numbers, capital A and capital B, and any integer greater than or equal to zero, capital M. If this is true, then this is true. And so applying this result to these two inequalities, we can conclude that absolute value of z to the power of n minus one minus k is less than or equal to capital M to the power of n minus one minus k. Similarly, we have that absolute value of w to the k is less than or equal to capital M to the K. So then we can use another result about real numbers, which is the following. Given any real numbers A, B, C, and D, this implies this, right? So notice these guys are, of course, greater than or equal to zero. So then from here, it follows that this guy times this guy is less than or equal to this guy times this guy. But from our properties of exponents, we just add the exponents. This is just capital M to the power of n minus 1. So what does this tell us? This tells us that every term of this sum is less than or equal to capital M to the n minus 1. So the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of this guy must be less than or equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of this guy. But what are we doing here? We are adding capital M to the n minus 1 by itself n times. Because how many integers are between 0 and n minus 1? n. So this is just equal to this. And so what we have shown here is given any complex numbers z and w, given any positive integer n, and given any real number capital M with these two properties, we have that this guy is less than or equal to this guy. Now, using this result, we are going to prove another preliminary result. So to prove this next preliminary result, let's give ourselves the same stuff that we had before. So we are going to apply this preliminary result that we just proved. And in this case, we're going to take z to be 1 plus z over n. We'll take w to be 1 plus w over n. We'll take n to be n. So then what about capital M? Well, we are going to find a real number, capital M, such that the absolute value of our choice of z is less than or equal to capital M, and the absolute value of our choice of w is also less than or equal to capital M. Well, notice, if we consider the absolute value of our choice of z, well, by the triangle inequality, this guy is less than or equal to the absolute value of 1 plus the absolute value of z over n. And what do we get from this? Well, we just get 1 plus absolute value of z over n. And since absolute value of z is less than or equal to capital M, this thing must be less than or equal to 1 plus capital M over n. Similarly, if we consider the absolute value of our choice of w, well, we apply the triangle inequality again. And this is just 1 plus absolute value of w over n. But then, since absolute value of w is less than or equal to capital M, this guy must be less than or equal to 1 plus capital M over n. So, what we see here is that the absolute value of our choice of z and the absolute value of our choice of w 
are both less than or equal to 1 plus capital M over N. So here we're going to take capital M to be 1 plus capital M over N. So with these four choices, we can say that this inequality is true. So let me call this preliminary result star. And so by star, we have the following. We have this. But now, if we were to simplify the absolute value that we have here, the ones are canceling out, but then we have z over n minus w over n. So combining those two into a single fraction, we get this, but then we know that we're essentially just going to have the absolute value of the numerator. So the ends will cancel out, and we're just left with absolute value of z minus w times this guy. But we can all agree that this guy is less than or equal to this guy. Because to go from here to here, all we did was, was we took this guy and multiplied it by 1 plus capital M over N. Right? And we get this guy. And 1 plus capital M over N is greater than or equal to 1. So we multiply this guy by a number greater than or equal to 1. Well, that's only going to make this guy bigger. And so that's why this happens. But then we know from our second result that this guy is less than or equal to e to the power of capital M. So we get this. So given any two complex numbers, z and w, positive integer n, and real number capital M with these two properties, we have that this guy is less than or equal to this guy. So now we're gonna prove the theorem. To start out the proof, let's suppose that Zn converges to Z. Well, since Zn converges to Z, it follows that the absolute value of Zn converges to the absolute value of Z. Right? The proof that this implies this is the same for real numbers. Because it turns out, just like how the reverse triangle inequality holds for real numbers, the reverse triangle inequality also holds for complex numbers. And so the reverse triangle inequality does all the heavy lifting, proving if this is true, then this is true. So this is a sequence of real numbers. And we know that every convergent sequence of real numbers is bounded. So the sequence of absolute value of z ends is a bounded sequence. Now, since this sequence is bounded, we should be able to find a real number that is greater than or equal to every term of this sequence. And so we're going to call that real number capital M. Now, we can also assume that the real number capital M that we found is also greater than or equal to absolute value of z. Because all we would have to do is choose a real number that satisfies this condition and choose a real number that satisfies this condition, take their maximum, and we have a real number satisfying both of these conditions. So now, what do we do from here? Remember, the whole goal is to prove that the limit of this sequence is equal to e to the z. And to prove that, it suffices to show the following. It suffices to show that the limit of this sequence is equal to zero. The reason why is because if we have shown that the limit of this sequence is equal to zero, well, remember, from our first fact, we know that the limit of this sequence is equal to e to the z. So with this and with this, if we apply the addition property of limits, it follows that the sum of these two sequences will converge to e to the z plus zero, which is equal to e to the z. But the sum of these two sequences is precisely this sequence. So we will have shown that this sequence converges to e to the z. So let's show that this is true. Now, we're going to show that this is true by definition of the limit of a sequence. And so by definition, 
This means for every epsilon greater than zero. There exists a positive integer, capital N, such that for all n greater than or equal to capital N, the axiom value of the nth term of this sequence is less than epsilon. So to prove that, let's give ourselves an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. From here, we want to figure out what we should choose capital N to be. Well, let's use the fact that Zn converges to Z. Since Zn converges to Z, we must be able to find a positive integer capital N, such that for all n greater than or equal to capital N, the absolute value of Zn minus Z is less than epsilon over e to the power of n. Right, because remember, the real number that we apply this statement to must be positive. And epsilon over e to the n is definitely positive. The reason why is because, well, first of all, epsilon is positive, and the reason why e to the n is positive is because that's what our second preliminary result tells us. So now, from here, we want to show for all n greater than or equal to capital N, the absolute value of the nth term of this sequence is less than epsilon. So let's give ourselves an arbitrary n greater than or equal to capital N. And now let's write out the absolute value of the nth term. Now, let's apply this preliminary result that we proved. In this case, we're going to be taking z to be zn. We're taking w to be z. We're taking n to be n. We're taking capital N to be capital N. Well, we know that absolute value of zn is less than or equal to capital N, and absolute value of z is less than or equal to capital N. That's precisely what this is telling us. So it follows that this inequality is true. But then, by the result that we have here, we know that absolute value of zn minus z is less than epsilon over e to the n. So we get this, but then the e to the m's cancel out and we're just left with epsilon. And so we have shown that the absolute value of the nth term of the sequence is less than epsilon. And that proves that the limit of this sequence is zero. And that was enough to say that the limit of this sequence is equal to e to the z. And so this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.